Hello, everybody. First of all, uh, let me uh, thank very warmly Dr. Arnold Aviv and all the organizers uh, of uh, uh, this uh, conference uh, for their kind invitation. Uh, I'm really sorry not uh, to be there uh, with you and uh, at the same time uh, very happy to uh, present uh, you my paper. Uh, the title of my paper is slightly different from the one uh, uh, which has been published uh, on the program. Uh, actually, uh, the new title is uh, Female Gaze, Optical uh, Unconscious and uh, Female Glance from uh, Male Spectator's uh, Point of View. Section uh, 1. Hannah Arendt as a, a Thracian maid. One of the Israeli documentaries made by uh, women I have been asked to comment on is Vita Activa, The Spirit of Hannah Arendt, 2015, directed by Ada Uspitz. This documentary is devoted both to the life and to the thought of uh, this uh, famous uh, woman uh, philosopher. Hannah Arendt was born in uh, 1906 uh, into a secular family of German Jews and uh, came uh, to uh, Jerusalem in uh, 1961 in order to report uh, of uh, the Adolf Eichmann trial for the New Yorker. In that occasion, uh, she coined the controversial uh, notion of uh, the banality of uh, evil to describe Eichmann's attitude towards Nazism. Of course, one of the ideal chapters of this documentary is focused on the secret love affair that, uh, as a young student uh, during the uh, 1920s, uh, she had uh, with uh, her teacher, the, the rising star, according to Hans Jonas's uh, expression, the rising star of the uh, uh, German philosophy, Martin Heidegger, who uh, in those uh, years uh, was writing the master, his masterpiece, uh, Being and Time, uh, published uh, in uh, 1927, and uh, who uh, would begin uh, by becoming rector of uh, Freiburg University in 1933, what the Belgian philosopher Jacques Tamignot called in his book about Arendt and Heidegger, I quote Tamignot, his long years of compromising with the Nazi regime. End quote. In her turn, precisely in 1933, Arendt left. Germany and in 1941 she arrived in the USA. Here, from 1946 to 1950, she publicly expressed her extreme bitterness. It's uh, uh, once again uh, an expression by uh, Tamino. Uh, her uh, extreme bitterness about uh, Heidegger and uh, his philosophy. Yet, uh, in uh, uh, 1950, I quote uh, Tamino again, she renewed her connection with uh, Heidegger, end quote, and contributed to an international rehabilitation of uh, his uh, philosophy. Despite this final uh, step of their intellectual relationship, Tamino argues, I quote him, that Anna Arendt's uh, two major Philosophical works, uh, The Human Condition, uh, published uh, in 1958, and uh, The Life uh, uh, of the Mind, uh, published posthumously in uh, 1978, uh, reveal uh, not at all a dependency upon Heidegger, but rather a constant and uh, increasing ironic uh, debate uh, with uh, him. End quote. Because of uh, his irony, uh, Tamino uh, titled uh, his book uh, on the intellectual relationship uh, between Arendt uh, and Heidegger, The Thracian Maid and the Professional Thinker. 
Arendt and Heidegger. This title makes reference to the famous anecdote by Plato concerning Thales, emblematically assumed as uh, the first philosopher. Indeed, in Plato's Theaetetus, we can read that, I quote Plato, while Thales uh, was uh, studying the stars uh, and uh, uh, looking upwards, he fell into a pit and a meat with the Thracian servant girl jeered at him, they say, because uh, he was uh, so eager to know the things in the sky that uh, he could not see what was uh, there before him at uh, uh, his very feet. Immediately after this anecdote, Plato makes a Socrates comment on it in the following way. The same uh, jest applies to all who pass their lives in uh, philosophy. It is precisely by echoing this uh, anecdote that uh, Tamino, no less emblematically, implicitly characterizes Heidegger as a philosopher falling in the pit of uh, Nazism while looking at uh, the highest uh, mysteries of being, with a capital B, and uh, Arendt as a, a young woman ironically approaching him. More generally, we could state that the famous anecdote by Plato concerning Thales constitutes a sort of a primordial characterization of a female gaze from a male philosopher's point of view, the one of Plato himself. Thus, from such a male spectator's point of view, the female gaze is expected to look at the earth rather than the sky namely to look at the concrete life uh, rather than abstract knowledge, namely to look at uh, what becomes rather uh, than what uh, always remains uh, the same, like stars were then expected uh, to do, namely to look at the realm of no philosophy rather than that of philosophy. In short, a young, uncultivated, concrete, and the joking female gaze transgressing the codes of male, old, serious, and cultivated people. Section 2. What is a documentary film? Any definition of what a documentary film is supposed to be shows uh, how much this genre uh, is based uh, on a long and complex uh, tradition of codes uh, concerning its aims, uh, its means, uh, and uh, its uh, uh, expectations. Inevitably, such a tradition conditions uh, the documentary filmmaking as much as uh, any other codified uh, tradition does uh, with respect uh, to its uh, connected uh, domain. In this context, uh, can the female uh, filmmaker's gaze really escape the documentary filmmaking codes uh, as the Thracian servant uh, girl was uh, supposed to do with the codes of male, old, serious and uh, cultivated people according to Plato's uh, anecdote? In other of the Israeli documentaries I have been asked to talk about uh, is titled Fatherland. Uh, 2015, and uh, uh, has been directed by Meital uh, Abukasis, uh, who was born uh, into a, a Jewish Moroccan immigrant family. In the first part of Abukasis' documentary, the experience of her father's migration is evoked during an interview that the filmmaker's off-screen voice addresses him as uh, he is uh, sitting on the sofa in the living room of uh, his home in uh, Dimona, uh, Israel. Let's watch uh, this uh, clip. Abba, what's your name? Where did you grow up? Where did you grow up? Tell me. Okay. My name is... Do you call me? Is it okay? איך שבא לך? קוראים לי אשר אבוקסיס. 
באשר היה מסעוד במרוקו. נולדתי בנובמבר 1947. עליתי ארצה ב-1955. הנה הייתם לי such a situation reminded me of the very similar scenario of the Italian American the documentary that the Martin Scorsese directed in 1974 on his parents who are sitting on the sofa in the living room of their apartment in Little Italy New York and talking about the experiences of their Sicilian immigrant families in America, whereas the filmmaker, in this case too, hides himself in an off-screen position in front of the sofa. Let's watch the clip. Now I'm putting my chair. Wait, my chair, my chair, my chair. You're rolling, big man. We should slay them today. Okay, Where are you sitting down there? Why? Why are you? I'm why is he down sorry. there? He can do what he wants. I don't do what he wants. Okay, so why are you so far from me? Come okay. All right, Get so closer. What? No, you come here. <laughs> That's it. That's more like it. Lovey-dovey sort of, you know. They say as you get older, your love goes stronger. So for some reason, it is getting a little stronger, you know. Right, Daddy? He's bashful. Yeah, I know. Well, I wanted to start. I wanted to. You, you were going to tell us about the sauce. You were going to show us how to do the sauce. Well, what should I say? Well, you can, you're going to you're going to get up and show it to us. But I wanted to know who, you know, how did you learn it? Well, what are you asking? About the sauce. Uh, how, who, who, how did you learn how to make sauce? Well, I'm supposed to be talking to you. You can talk to yes. me. You can talk to them. It doesn't matter. I'll be over here. I'll be over here. Should I mention your name? No, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you mentioned my name. Yeah. You want, what should I say? You want me to know, you want me to tell you how my, the, how, how I learned how, how to make yes, so? Yes, how did you learn well, how to make Why don't you ask me the question? Don't you hear that then? No. <laughs> I mean, if you would ask me a question, I would answer. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it now. Right? I, I want to know how you learned how to make sauce. Who taught you, who taught it to you? How long, I mean, how many years, how many years you've been doing it? And I want to see you do it. Well, you know, when you first get married, you're really not much of a cook. I watched my mother make sauce. I watched my mother. Well, some kids didn't like uh, certain things, and she used to yeah. satisfy them in different ways. And then... She became a better cook because of that? No, no. Well, my, my mother-in-law was a good cook, but the thing is that she... Uh, she couldn't cook the way she wanted. See, beginning with her husband, my father-in-law, he, he used to cook for himself, so he's giving a better example right there. Eh? Such a frontality spontaneously evokes uh, one of the basic features uh, traditionally attributed uh, to the documentary, understood as uh, the exploration uh, that a disembodied gaze develops uh, into a separate uh, object uh, in order to present uh, some factual uh, evidences of it, uh, following uh, the modern conception of uh, Western uh, painting. Uh, this uh, this uh, modern conception of a Western painting is emblematically represented in uh, uh, a, a famous uh, uh, image that uh, uh, Albert Durer published uh, in uh, uh, the second edition of uh, uh, a treaty uh, of uh, his. Uh, this uh, this uh, image is uh, traditionally known as uh, Durer's uh, uh, prospectival of course, uh, uh, looking is uh, always a gendered activity, as well as uh, being historically and uh, culturally characterized. This is true both for the male painter looking at the Dura's uh, perspectival grid and for the contemporary female filmmaker. However, the heavy tradition of codes in which uh, those historical and culturally gendered gazes are inscribed inevitably tends to hide their peculiar characterization. This is the reason why we should state that such a peculiar characterization gives itself away rather than showing itself over to it. On this subject, a notion sketched by another German Jewish philosopher, contemporary 
to Anna Arendt, uh, namely uh, Walter Benjamin, could be helpful. In his 1936 essay titled The Work of Art at the Age of uh, Its Technical Reproducibility, uh, Benjamin proposes the germinative concept of uh, optical unconscious, which in the English translation of uh, uh, this essay's uh, first version, precisely the, it edited by Anna Arendt, had been mistranslated as unconscious optics. What Benjamin writes sounds rather uh, like this, I quote him. It is uh, through the camera that uh, we first discover the optical unconscious, just as we discover the instinctual, uh, the tribhaft uh, unconscious uh, through psychoanalysis, end quote. Benjamin means that the photography and the cinema have the ability uh, to record and reveal uh, aspects of our relationship with the world that get registered in our uh, senses but are never quite consciously processed. Because they happen uh, too quickly, they are too small or they get uh, dispersed. This is where, uh, Benjamin explains, the camera comes into play with uh, all its uh, resources of uh, swooping and uh, rising, disrupting and isolating, uh, stretching or compressing a sequence, enlarging or, or uh, reducing an object. End quote. Therefore, such uh, uh, resources are uh, just uh, as many ways uh, through which uh, the camera can make us uh, discover some aspects uh, of the visible that, that remain covered in our vision. Sometimes uh, these aspects uh, remain covered uh, to the operator too. Sometimes uh, the operator's uh, gaze, uh, thanks uh, to its peculiar uh, uh, historical and uh, cultural gendered uh, characteristics uh, is able to discover those uh, aspects uh, and uh, the operator's creativity can decide uh, to let uh, them appear on screen or even to point uh, them out in the images that uh, such creativity is uh, elaborating. In turn, uh, just uh, in uh, this way, some peculiar historical and cultural gendered uh, uh, characters uh, of the operator's gaze can give themselves away despite the documentary filmmaking codes. And uh, uh, it seems uh, to me that uh, precisely some uh, camera resources uh, similar uh, to the ones evoked by Benjamin uh, give away in a particular uh, uh, efficient way, the filmmaker's female gaze transgressing the documentary filmmaking codes in the documentaries I am considering here. In the case of the fatherland, I am going to show you uh, what, in my opinion, is an example of optical unconscious, revealed by the camera and revealing the filmmaker's female gaze. This needs uh, some uh, preliminary remarks, uh, which I will borrow from uh, Edwards as uh, Cases uh, book, uh, The World uh, at uh, a Glance, uh, published uh, in 2007. In this book, Casey reminds us that the English language has uh, two different terms to designate, uh, I quote to Casey, uh, the two great modes of uh, human looking. That is to say, the words uh, gaze and glance. Then he specifies that uh, these two kinds of uh, visual perception shouldn't uh, uh, be considered as uh, uh, single, simple acts, but rather as uh, two, I quote cases again, families of uh, closely uh, related acts, which Casey proposes to schematize uh, as you see, uh, we have uh, two. Uh, uh, kinds of uh, looking, precisely uh, gazing and uh, glancing, and uh, 
each of them uh, is uh, uh, divided in uh, different modes and uh, different modalities uh, of, uh, of uh, looking. These uh, modalities are understood by Casey as the detailed ways in which modes themselves are uh, enacted. After commenting on this schema, it, Casey provides us with a further specification. Glancing and the gazing themselves are capable of a close cooperation. End quote. Precisely, this close cooperation seems to be at work in the sequence taken from uh, Father. Indeed, in such a sequence, the glimpsing glance uh, seems to act as the optical unconscious of the filmmaker's female gaze, making her include her mother's extraneous movement in the right side of the screen, whereas the filmmaking codes obviously would impose to eliminate them. In this way, we can state about that sequence what the Benjamin wrote when introducing his notion of optical unconscious. Uh, I quote Benjamin, a space informed by human consciousness gives way to a space informed by the unconscious. End quote. Differently from such a documentary, in a vita attiva the spirit of Anna Arendt, in my opinion the filmmaker's gaze particularly shows its female character in a sequence in which gazing is properly not in close cooperation with glancing. Rather, it is thanks to the prolonged staring mode of that gaze, to use Ed Casey's categories, that the optical unconscious of this very gaze manifests the gender, the feature of it. This sequence shows a part of the filmmaker's interview uh, to Jerome McCone, uh, Anna Arendt's uh, former assistant and a director of the Anna Arendt Center at the New School, uh, New York. She didn't think Heidegger was an evil man, and it is not Heidegger never killed anybody or anything like that. He never he 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 he, 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 he was absolutely bamboozled. He was made a fool of. He made a fool of himself, but this was a real, a, a real thinker. But when she said, "When the chips are down, that's when thinking becomes a phenomenon. It enters the phenomenal world as judgment." No, I will not do that. Heidegger didn't do it. He didn't say, "No, I will not become rector." But this is exactly the banality of evil, suspending thought. <laughs> well, that would, that is... <laughs> yeah, it is, it is in a way a counterpart, I suppose, yes. In such a sequence, uh, Cohn uh, is uh, explaining that uh, despite uh, Ardegas uh, compromising with the Nazi regime, uh, Arendt uh, did not uh, uh, judge that uh, he, he was uh, an evil uh, man. Kohn explains uh, with a conviction that uh, Heidegger was a real thinker and that uh, what he did wrong was not refusing compromising with the, the Nazi uh, regime. According to Kohn, he just uh, did not say the fundamental no, I will not become a rector. That's all. Yet, precisely in that moment of the sequence, we hear the female voice of the filmmaker asking him, uh, I quote, uh, this is exactly the banality of evil suspending thought, no? The deep philosophical implications and the candid tone of such a question spontaneously remind us of the attitude of the Thracian maid, but uh, now it is the professional thinker who explodes in an uncontrolled, uh, long-lasting laugh, while the filmmaker's female gaze through her camera stares commentlessly at his face for a no shorter time 
once again transgressing all filmmaking codes, but at the same time powerfully revealing the disturbing effect that looking at that love inevitably produces. But this is exactly the banality of evil, suspending thought. <laughs> well, that with that. Is... <laughs> in other terms, the optical unconscious, which consists in the unnecessary, unusual length of the last part of the, that sequence, and uh, which is uh, stressed by the absence of all the comments is what reveals the female filmmaker's doubt that the professional thinker's laugh was an embarrassed and embarrassing reaction faced to the unexpected female introduction uh, into the professional world he felt he represented, namely that of the male, old, serious and cultivated people. These are some of the reasons why such a differently transgressive gaze and their optical unconscious are so important to us. Thank you for your attention.